You know, I, I want us to know that we come to church with expectation. Excitement and expectation are the key elements to revival. Excitement and, and, and expectation are key, are key ingredients to anything. <laughs> anything that you want to grow, move forward. Uh, no, one, no, one's, no, one, no one is sad when a baby comes out. A baby comes out and everybody's like, okay, well, you, it doesn't matter what the circumstances the baby's conceived in. Well, congratulations, by the way. Uh, they're married. I just want to say that they are married. <laughs> but, but, I was, but when the baby comes out, when the baby comes out, everybody's happy. And then even, even anticipating, no matter what the circumstances are, expectation creates excitement. And, I, you know, I, I think it was wonderful. I saw a text from Pastor Maggie this week to her team and to the, to the worship team, and she said, uh, what are you, what, is, what does it look like when the light switch flips on for us? Uh, what is your expectation? What do you expect, what is your expectation? And I think to myself, all week I've been in an expectation for what's happening today, what's going to happen today. My expectation is fairly, very, very high, and it's probably based upon some of the things I've been seeing. When you see tumors dissolve in people's necks and you see uh, growths go in front of your eyes and you see major things happening, you come to church expecting. You know, I got a text from this last trip that I was on last week. I got a text. The pastor goes, oh, by the way. I thought that was a great introduction to a great testimony. Oh, by the way, you prayed for a guy last week who his short-term memory was gone. He was in a car accident. And he had no short-term memory. The guy comes to me after service, and I'm standing in line talking to people, and he, said, he stands behind me, and I turn around, and he's there. He's like, can you pray for me? And he says, I had an accident years ago, and I have no short-term memory. I will forget this conversation. The moment I leave you, before I get home, I won't even know what to tell my wife we talked about. And, I, and so, you know, how many of you know compassion hits you at that point? You go, that's not right for anybody to have. So, you know, we, we pray, I pray for him, and I'm just thinking, you know, believing in the Lord. And that the, the, the key to me at that moment was he no longer has his mind, but he has the mind of Christ. How many of you know you can pray the mind of Christ into Alzheimer's? You can pray the mind of Christ into, because the mind of Christ took on everything. And I literally released on him what was the last message I preached before I went on the trip was, I'm going to call you Red Hooded. Remember Red Hooded? Red Hooded was that you would have a red hood, that God puts the red hood over you. And the Red Hooded is this, is that Jesus bled from his, from his forehead, resisting insanity. Resisting insanity. The only reason you bleed from your, your, your forehead is if you're sweating, if you're resisting something. You're resisting insanity. He resisted. That was the first bloodshed, bloodshed for a person's mind, is that they have the power to resist. Then the next was a crown of thorns that came upon his head that was the, the ability to be victorious in your thoughts. Now I don't have to fight thoughts every day. I can actually be victorious in thoughts. Isn't it wonderful? So we released that on him. and get a text, and the text said, this man went home. Uh, he hasn't been able to drive. He hasn't been able to do certain things for himself. He, he doesn't even know where the church is. He went home, told his wife everything that happened on the weekend, he, he felt, he said, he, he actually woke up the next day saying the cloud was lifted from me. That's exactly how he announced it to his wife. Told her everything that happened in, that weekend. Then got in his car, well, actually on that Sunday, drove to church, drove to a special event he'd never been to because he couldn't get there. How many know God can do something like that? And once you see God doing things like that, a short-term memory, he's, he literally opened the conversation with the doctors can't do anything for me. Now, now. I want you to understand, when you, can, when you can actually experience God moving in a way that doctors don't have any way, any form to shift and change, and you know it happens at church, I, I, you just can't come to church going, well, what you going to say this to me, Pastor? Because the hunger for me to come to church is to see God. The hunger for me to come to church is to know God's moving. If you get another sermon with not, without a change, then there's no God moving. If you get a message that you can go away and go, oh, that was just great information, then that's not God moving. But the key element of receiving that is expectation and excitement in the word, excitement in the worship, excitement to be in the house of God, excitement to be with believers, 
I mean, the anticipation. I mean, what I love about going and being on the road, which I believe that we have here in the name of Jesus, is that we come to church going, I don't know what's going to happen today, but it's going to be good. Anything can happen today. And if a church doesn't have that, then I believe that we're not in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God has that. You can't, you can't wake up with Jesus and go, man, what do you have planned today, Jesus? Because I don't think he wakes up and does the same thing every day. And I think he catches you off guard and has suddenlies and surprises. So I'm just going to ask us because I'm coming to church every week with an expectation. I'm seeing God move in a way that I've not seen him move in years. I mean, with ease and comfort and confidence and miracles. But I, I notice that the people that are getting miracles and the people that are experiencing God, whether it's financial miracles, one person pledged. We have a No Limits offering coming in January, January 5th. This, I went to Tulsa and helped them do a No Limits offering. person pledged to give $25,000. A No Limits offering is this. You don't have the money. You're not even going, even if you had it, you're not taking it from your bank account. You're not actually going into your account, your resources, your reserve to actually get it. You're actually saying, God, I'm believing that you can bring this amount to me, surprise me with it, and I will, say, I will call that seed that, that needs to be sown. It's not about you having the money. That's one of the things the Lord really wanted us to get away from is taking offerings based upon what you have. He wants to be the God that supplies the need. And that you set yourself up with a need, and then he brings the supply. The gentleman said, and on one side, we do it like our vision offering. One side, you, you write out what you believe your vision is. He said, I want my children. I'm just, in, I'm just talking about where I've been. Is that all right? We haven't even given him a message. My, my, the numbers haven't even started rolling. So, so the countdown hasn't gone. So I'm, I'm t- I just welcome myself back. You know, so he's, he says, I want my children to come to church with me. I want my children to work in my business with me. And I'm believing that, that, Lord, the seed that I'm sowing to get to believe that that's the harvest, the seed that I'm believing that you're going to give me because you're a supplier of seed is $25,000. He went into his office the next morning, got a phone call. The seed came in. His partner said, I just got a check for, for you on a case that we did years ago. And it was a case that was over, but they owed us, they owed you $25,000. He sowed that. Now, I thought to myself, if that's the seed, what does the harvest look like? If God's going to give, if God's thinking about your harvest in such a way that he's willing to give you that kind of seed. And, and so I want you to know that's, that's, that's we're going to have a no limits, no limits Sunday on January 5th. Stepping in. And, and, I, and I didn't do a no limits Sunday this last year. I didn't do, I didn't do one and I got rebuked by God. He, he said, Tracy, you're doing this for Paul Brady, and his faith and his church is rising from it. And you have kept your church faith down because you have not allowed me to be their supplier. And I repent before you for not activating your faith in God. Because it's, it's easy to give money that you have. But it's one thing to say, God, if, if I can trust you to give me what I don't think I can give, then I see you in a different light, and you see me in a different light, and we all rise in this. Amen? I, I'm coming with expectation. Financial miracles, physical miracles, miracles, family miracles, miracles are happening in the earth because God wants to be a supernatural God. We're going to step into 2020. It's going to be the most supernatural year you've ever experienced in your life. It, there, will be, there will be nothing, nothing normal. Nothing normal will come unless you choose the normal life. Unless you choose the normal life. You you can choose normal. But I'm telling you, there will be nothing normal. There will be nothing normal uh, that God is doing in 2020. He's not interested in normal in 2020. I'll give you you a little hint of what the word. I'll give you the word of the Lord for next year, and I'll preach it on on the 29th. Is that all right? He said, this is the year I'm going to be astonishing. That doesn't hit with you, but it hits with me. Because I've not been astounded by God. I've seen him do amazing things, and I go, wow, that's amazing. But astounding is completely different. God wants a people who looks for him to be astounding. He wants to astonish you. He doesn't want to normalize you. He wants to astonish you. He wants to be a supernatural God that comes and does something that just blows your mind. Your science goes completely out, and the knowledge that you thought you had of God is completely changed. 
The word astonished in the Greek means to be enveloped by him. You have filled me and wrapped me in such a way that I can't get my mind off of any, any, I can't get my mind off of you. I'm astounded by you. 2020 is going to be the year of astonishment. And he's going to show himself as a supernatural God. Absolutely. 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 And he said, Tracy, I've prepared you for a year of influence. I've spent a year with influencers so that I can get you ready for the increase because the spirit of increase is Oxano, and it's the same power that's dissolving everything. He, everywhere, everywhere I see things change, it's the spirit of increase. It's the spirit of increase. He said, when, my wife, when, when I called my wife up and we were praying for that woman who, who couldn't even raise her hand because of the lump that was under her arm, her husband was so nervous about it. They came up and already had prayer for their No Limits offering, and I prayed for them. They went out, and he came, they came back, and they said, I want something so desperately my wife needs to be healed. She has stage 3 cancer, and she, and she has a lump under her arm that she can't even lift her arm. She can't even lift her arm. And we, I prayed. I just said, Go! And then she falls out in the power of God. My wife, I ask her to come, and she lays hands on her. And what the Lord says, what I'm releasing is increase. I release so much increase of life because the word oxano is the word life. It's the word increase. It's the inc so much increase of life that death can't stay there. How many of you already have so much life that's flowing in you that death can't stay there? See, we, we don't go, on, we, we're not just healing the sick. We're releasing so much life that it overwhelms sickness. We call, I called that front, the front, front lobe. I, saw, I said, your front lobe is dead. God shows me that increase. Oxano hits your front lobe. God says, I needed to get you influential in your mind so I can give you increase to walk out what you're supposed to walk out. Don't think that you're going to go into this next level just doing things. God wants you to be so impactful. We have to be impactful. I didn't. Anyway, to tell you all this that I, I can't go. I can't go, I can't come to service with a normal service. And it doesn't mean we have to get do it. I don't want to manufacture anything any, either. But I do want to have an expectation that something's forced out of heaven. I, the Lord shared with me and I shared it with the people that I was with in, 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 in Pittsburgh. I said, listen, the Lord showed me that I've been a part of every move of God that's ever been in the earth since, 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 the night, since I was born again. I was born again in 89. I've never missed a move of God. I've never missed one. Never missed one. And I know we're on one. I know we're, we're on a wave. I, just, yeah, I said we're on it. We're riding this wave, and we're riding it, and we can miss it. Don't let foolishness get involved in your life right now. Don't let stupidity distract you. We're in a move of God. And this move of God is going to bring in wealth, and it's going to bring in prosperity, because I'm tired of having a dream to change the world and having no money to do it. I'm tired of having people who want to go to missions and who want to plant churches and we don't have the money to send them out. I'm telling you right now, I need to be like that father that is able to send the son out. And the power of David was the coffers he had. That's what empowered Solomon. The dream is really being held back by the fact that we need to have we need to have first the right mindset, which is an influence mindset. And secondly, the increase mindset, which is we're not going to be satisfied with what we have right here. Isn't that right, Jeff? We're not going to be satisfied with what we have right here. The Lord's challenged me. He said, the last building that I looked at for us to buy was $22 million. And that was for something that they're tearing the property down. They're tearing it down. They're going, to build four, they're going to build four towers on it that are almost 50 stories. And he says, no churches. No churches buy buildings. The churches that own buildings downtown Bellevue, you know who they are? They've had them for 100 years. And he says, I need you to raise the mindset of the believer so that they stop going away from. Because it's easy if we go over to Issaquah, we go to Fall Cities, we buy property. Okay, you guys, you have to understand. So what is he saying? He says, he says, we have to raise, elevate the church to be people who says, we'll spend $22 million on that piece of property. The kingdom of God should not be able to be margined out of something because of money. 
Why should we give up a downtown because we can't afford it? And why should we have another master that we're leasing from? I'm, this is my own personal battle. Hopefully you will join in it. I want you to know God wants us to be people that says, God, if that's what it's going to take, elevate me to it. He doesn't want people that are running from it. He wants people that are elevating to it. I'm not preaching yet. I'm going to talk about the king of kings in a moment. But I need you to understand, we need to have an expectation. God wants us to win this world. I'm telling you, buying property is nothing like we're going to have to do when we go and buy property in Dubai, which is illegal, impossible. You can't do it. But I know we're going to do it. And if we can't get it here, how are we going to go into the, how are we going to go into some place where it's not just a money issue? It's about mindsets. The Lord is constantly adjusting our mindset. And so the mindset of expectation is important in this season. You never know which service can break out. You never know. You never know which service is it. That's why I'm coming to church every week. I'm like, you know, I don't know. It may be the one. But I'm sitting on one. I'm, 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 I'm hatching something. Do you feel like you guys are hatching something? I feel like I'm hatching something. I mean, I see miracles, and, 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 and literally, I said, God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm becoming astonished with you by the things that I see you doing when I travel, that I don't know what 2020 looks like when you said that's when it really starts. I mean, there's so many miracles. I'm, we're just giving you the big, the highlight, some, some highlight reel. There's so many things that are happening. Why shouldn't it happen here? Why does the Northwest have to watch everything happening somewhere else? Why do we have to go, oh, look what's happening over there in Texas. Look what's happening over there in, in Florida. Look what's happening over there. In, uh, there. I can talk with y'all right up in here. Okay, we went a little Ebonics at the end. But it's okay. You guys with me? So, Father, we, re we reach our hands up with expectation, God. With expectation. We're thirsty. We're so thirsty. We're in the wettest, driest place there is, Lord. And we're so thirsty. We're thirsty. If we're thirsty as believers, how much more than unbelievers, God? We ask, Father, that you would visit the Northwest. Make it a habitation and pour out something that is astonishing. We commit expectation and excitement to it, God. Those are the seeds that we sow, expectation and excitement, God. We sow the seed of expectation. God is going to move. Oh, God is going to move. Oh, we sow expectation to it, God. God, you're going to move in this territory, in this territory, in the Northwest, you're going to move, God. You're going to move, God, and it's going to be astonishing. And we will publicize it. We will spread it. We will declare it. We will share it. We will preach it. We will draw all sinners to you. We will draw all righteous to you. We will draw anyone that will listen to you. Lord, we thank you for expectation and excitement, God. Now, Father, we ask that you would baptize us and prepare us for what you're up to. Lord, align us to you, your, your desire. And we open the doors for the Holy Spirit to move in this church, in this building, on the street, wherever and whatever you desire to do. Because normal church is boring. I just can't get with it. I just can't even get with it. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even handle normal church. I mean, even if it was more like a concert, it's still normal. I want the face of God. Woo! All right, here we go. All right, so praise the Lord. Thank you for the welcome home. Let me just tell you what's on my heart, even though I'm wearing a sweater that is pretty cool. Baby shark, duck, down, da, da. Baby shark, duck, down, da, 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 da. Baby shark, da, 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 da. Baby shark. All right.
<laughs> for about three years, for about three years, we went into we we went into the book of John because we wanted to study Jesus. We wanted to study Jesus because one of the things that's very important. We did a series last week, last year, called Christology. If your Christology is off, your whole doctrine is off. If your picture of Jesus is off, it doesn't matter what you preach, what you say, everything is off. And so we want to make sure we know and understand Jesus. We, we talked about Jesus as the light of the world until we hit chapter 15, and it took us three years to do that. I'm hoping that we can move through this, but God wants us to spend some time on Jesus. When we got to 13, we recognized that Jesus had been almost convincing, almost like sharing his case with people. I'm the light of the world. This is why this. I am this, and this is why this. And this is, and he's almost sharing his case. And then there was a point at 13 that people said, we are going to follow you. And they started to talk about being a king. They started refer referring to him as a king or making, trying to make him, trying to force him to become their king. So there was a shift from someone who was pleading his case to shifting into a position of a king. And so this series we're going to step into is Jesus the King. We have to know Jesus the King. And what's really important is, is you understand that there's, there's not a multi, multifaceted Jesus, but there is a multifaceted office that Jesus inhabits. He, he sits in an office that you could actually be stuck in a, a one-sided relationship with him if you don't allow him to reveal the fullness of his office. Now, if you look in the scriptures, you'll find, in, in, you know, you'll search it out, and you may find something that's in one of these new translations. But if you, if you really search it out, you will find that the, the, the word king and savior don't ever come into the same reference. But you will find most often used prince and savior, prince and life, prince and, you know, deliverer. But you won't find king and savior. And the reason is, is because when he saved you, he saved you as a prince. When we relate to Jesus as our savior, we're relating to him as our prince. That's why we can be the brethren of. Right? You understand? That's why he's the first of many brethren. He, he, he's, he's in that place. If you understand the differences between a prince and a king, you want to understand the differences between a prince and a king. A prince is not a king. A prince has in its future a kingdom and a king position. But when what they do, they still have a subservient position to a, to a king because the king is in setting in place all of his design and desire. And the prince is outworking what the king is declaring. You understand? Now, this is important to know that we just received Jesus as Savior. You may be missing him as king. Because saving me is different than leading me. You can be a prince that saves me, but I never want to follow you. But once I start to follow you, then I have to shift my perspective of you, and I can't allow you just to be my prince, but now you have to be more than my savior, but you have to be my leader. You have to be the, my, 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 right? You have to be the one that I'm actually going to submit my life to. And what we have in the body of Christ is we have a lot of people, most of the body wants to relate to the prince. But the revelation of the king is the only way we can change the world. We must have the king that manifests his kingdom because a prince manifests the kingdom that is from a king, but we have to have a prince that saves us from the demonic or from the work of darkness, but that king is really what establishes the next direction and the directives of your life. Amen. So we're going to look at this, and I want you to read this in that perspective with me. We're going to do a lot of reading. Is that right? Woo, it's going to be fun. First John 15, we're going to start right in the first verse. It says, I am the true vine. Now, I want you to see this because he's talking about a, he's talking about being, he's talking about a garden, and gardening is husbandry, right? It's this He's talking about the husbandry activity here that's in the garden. But in it, you need to understand it's, a, it's an analogy of what the king is expecting to manifest in your life. Kingly. Someone say kingly. 
He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I want you to see this. There, there, is, a, there is a cutting either way. I, th- I was hoping someone would get that. Thank you. for Because a lot of people don't know that there's a cutting every, any way. There's a cutting if you bear fruit, and there's a cutting if you don't bear fruit. So don't be, don't, be, don't be mad if you get cut. Because the realization, one cut gets rid of you, one cut makes you better. I would rather be cut to be better than be cut to get rid of. Don't get rid of me, Jesus. I am going to grow. I am willing to grow. I want oxano flowing through me. Trim me, prune me, pull me back, let the nutrients go to the right spot, but don't, for, don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. It's amazing. People will give up on you on the wrong seasons. You got to know that there is a don't, don't give up on me. Let me con- prune me. We have to see this. He says this. He says that, that it may bear more fruit. The only reason, God, you may be feeling like you're pruned a little bit right now is because the king knows you can have more fruit. He says you are, you are, you are clean. I love this term. You are clean. Someone say I'm clean. See, this is where I think the church is really so busy trying to get saved over and over and over and over and over and over again is that we don't realize his word is constantly cleaning us. We wouldn't treat church as a frivolous thing, get there when I can, if we knew every time the word was coming, we're getting clean from something. How many of you, you, know, how many of you know that you're cleaner today than you were yesterday? Come on, just declare it. I know you're doubting it right now, but you're cleaner today than you were yesterday. His word, he said, my word, by my word, because of my word, you are clean. Now that's, why is that hard to understand? I mean, we were just talking about, you, Tony was sharing what you posted, and that, that if a person reads their Bible one to three days a week, that they still have the same challenges. But once they get to four times a, a week, then that challenge, they get victorious. From 60, something like 60% more victorious or victory in their life. And if you go five, that, that because of the word, your reading of the word, daily reading of the word, you are clean. Jesus says, because my word, not just because I am the word, it's one thing to have a word on your desk. But he says, it's, it's one thing that I'm actually with you, but because of what I get to speak into you, you're clean. He says this because he says you're clean. He says, I am the vine. No, I'm sorry. I skipped there. He says, in verse 4, he says, abide in me, and I in you, and, the, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of, its, of itself unless it abides in the vine. So abiding means to literally house yourself, be, be immersed into it. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The word is saying, if my words are in you, then you will actually be so fruitful that I'll be able to manifest through you what I am. Jesus is completely, absolutely fruitful. I'm going to talk to someone over here. Jesus is absolutely fruitful. When it looks like it's not going his way, he's fruitful. When it looks like it's not going to be a good day, it's fruitful for him. Jesus has never had an unfruitful day in his life. Now, if that word abides in you, what do you expect to happen to your life? And if you allow that word to abide in you, to abide in you, to actually have its framework in you, to allow your thoughts to be framed around it, do you know what kind of impulse that would bring into your life? It would be a fruitful impulse where you're constantly growing, constantly increasing. Now, this is going to be good. Verse 6, he says, if if anyone does not abide in me, which is a choice, isn't it? If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. So it's, it's one thing, he says, if, you, if my words abide in you, I know I'm taking a long time to track this down, but it's important. If my words abide in you and you abide in my words, then you're going to be getting your nutrients from me. I'm going to be supplying you. But if you don't abide in me, you're going to be cut off. So what is he saying? I need to keep the word in me. So that I can stay in God. And when I stay in God, then he's going to bring his supply through me. And if the supply goes through me, then it's going to push his fruit out of me. That's an amen spot right there. 
I know you're trying to fruit yourself. I know you're trying to fruit yourself. You're trying to be the one that manifests fruit yourself. But if we can just get the word in us. Oh, if we can just get the word in us. If we get the word in us, then it gives us that expectation and it gives us that excitement. And then the fruit starts to push through us because it's not me who's pushing the fruit out. It's him who's bearing the fruit. And he's saying, I can bear fruit to the level I'm willing to yield to the word that keeps me in him. The word has to keep me in him. Amen. The word of God has to keep me in him. So when God tells me something, I need to believe it. I don't want to be withered. Come on, is anyone feeling more withered this year than last year? Let's not do that. Because that means I'm not abiding. If I feel drier this year in the, in the negative, not that I'm just hungry for God. I, I, you know, I just, I want us to know that you can feel dry and not be dry. I know that there's more fruit to come through me. I feel like I have a branch that's big enough for more fruit. And they gathered them and throw it into the fire, and they were burned. And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, if you abide in me, there he is, and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire. And it shall be done for you. I, I think that's a beautiful thing. So you mean, God, if, I, if I'm in you, and you're in me, and I stay lodged in you, I stay connected in you by keeping your word in me, then I can ask whatever I desire. Because I know my desires are clean because of your word. You know what I deal with a lot of people, they don't know if what they're asking for is clean. I don't know if it's the will of God. That's how they say it. But if his word's in you, and you're abiding in him, that means you're so one. Your thoughts are no different than his. Your ways are no different than his. Your actions are no different than his. You're so much of a one with him. That now you can ask whatever you want. I'm going to sit on this because I want to, before I read the next verse. How many of you have some things that you're asking for? Are you asking for his desire or yours? How do you know? I remember the Lord, I mean, he, I told you, I, told, I think I told our leadership, I said, the Lord rebuked me because I'm asking stuff. Well, basically, I wasn't asking. I, wasn't, I had a desire, but I wasn't asking. I was saying, God, just give me your desire. And he's like, I don't want that. I want to know what your desires are. What do you desire? And the only reason you're not asking, Mr. Armstrong, is because you don't know if your desires are clean. Because you know if your desires are clean. Not that it's evil or unrighteous. But do I, have this, do I desire this for the same reason he desires it? I know he desires it, and I know I desire it, but do I desire it for the same reason? Because if I desire it and he desires it, doesn't mean we have the, le ink, the equal desire. Just because he wants me to stand there, and I want to stand there. I won't want to stand there because it's my best side. He wants me to stand there because it's his glory. That, that means it's a corrupt standing, even though we have the same desires. Come on, somebody. I want you to hear it. Even though we have the same desires, it may be the right thing for the wrong reason. Is this, this too much? So we need to know, hide the word in our heart. Because what you're about to do is going to be so unleashing, you don't want to have to pull it back. If you step into this level of fruitfulness and you start asking your desire, you don't want to change your mind later going, oh, my gosh. I got a call this week, text this week from people that we love, and they're like, we're, we're moving on from, you know, what we're doing. And I'm like, okay. My thought is, but you so desperately desired it. You so desired it that you took it out of my hands. And now you're shutting it down. Well, maybe you desired it rightly, but wrongly. I, 
I know it is, and that's why you guys, this is just going to get happier. The closer we get to the resurrection of Jesus, <laughs> it gets nicer. <laughs> Maybe. I want you to understand that this is not supposed to be because there's so much power that's about to come through you. You want to make sure that you're not a, to- a toddler with a, with a, with a bazooka. Baby shark, 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 did, 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 did. baby shark, did, 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 did. come on, somebody! I, I, I want you to, I want you to know God's equipping you with, with a, with a tank, and you can't go around here with little baby ideas, because you'll be blowing up stuff that you need to go and sleep in later. He says, if you ask whatever you will, whatever you desire, what's in your desire? Stop lying about your desires. Whatever you desire, ask it. I need to have confidence that when I desire something and when I ask it, I'm asking it in the right cleanness, in the equal equal position that God's in, so that when that bazooka goes boom, boom, and it starts to unlock the fire that is behind it, I will never have to go, no, 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 casualties, 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 and casualties, casualties, and casualties, 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 because I didn't know how to control myself. My desire can leave casualties, even though it's right. And what he's asking, he says, I want you to act like a king. See, there's prayers that I prayed like a prince that I look back and I go, those prayers actually needed to be kingly. There's things that I've been believing for that God says you can't get into because you're still princely in your heart and your mind instead of kingly. And before I go to this next level, and before you go to the next, ne- next level, you and I need to understand the power of a being a king. Because the truth of the matter is Jesus, you know, so powerful. Jesus, he's a king. But they call him, you know how they say he's the prince of life? They call him the king of kings. So his word is kingly if it gets in the kings. He's not trying to be the prince of the air or prince. He's, try, he's actually the king of kings. He's actually the king of kings. And so he's saying here, if I have the, if my, my word is fruitful, But in order for you to make that word fruitful, you need to act like a king. Because, okay, so there's only a few references of king of kings in the Bible. There's one, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, he's known as the king of kings. How many of you have ever read that? He's the king of kings. And his reference in the book of Daniel in in chapter 2 of the king of, of king of kings is the fact that he is like, an elevated king. He's the greatest of all kings. Not that he's the monarch of monarchs. He's the greatest monarch that has ever been in that time. You understand? So there's, there's two understandings that we can have. That you can be a king of kings because there's no other king that can defeat you. Or you can be the king of kings because you have such power that you're able to delegate it. And, and that everybody that you delegated to also operate in that same kingly authority. That's what the vine is all about. The vine is saying, I'm trying to supply to you. I can't talk kingly to you because kingly would not help you understand. See, Isaiah tells us that the the vine is associated to the powers that come with the king. So the vine is saying, listen, You're not going to be a king because you're kingly. You're going to be a king because I'm kingly. I'm going to bring my supply of kingly authority to you. Use it wisely. Because he's the king of kings. Do we have the picture of that? that It's it's an interesting picture. We'll we'll come back to this other one. So when when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, how many of you remember Nebuchadnezzar had the dream? He had the dream of, of of this statue, the head of gold, uh, the bust of silver, and, and the bronze uh, loins, waist, the legs of iron. And then down below, there was a mixture. 
mixture of clay and iron. And these all represent, these all represent the kingdoms. He, and, 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 and Daniel says, oh, God shows me that Nebuchadnezzar, you are this kingdom. You're the kingdom that is completely gold and powerful and mighty. You're the greatest of all kingdoms. So he's saying you are the king of kings. But then the part of the dream that no one ever draws, which is so powerful, is that in the dream there is a mountain. And it says that there is a stone, a rock that's cut out of the mountain. Oh, come on, somebody. And that rock is cut out of the mountain, and that rock is used to break. And it says God himself is going to be set up as a king, and that his kingdom will come out of a mountain, out of heaven, and that kingdom will be more powerful than any other kingdom, and he will set himself up a king. See, we don't draw a big, I wish we had a big stone hammer right here that would show that all the kingdoms of the earth are going to come under the submission of a king who is truly a king. And that one, one hammer, one, I want you to know the reason we can't give up the fight and turning around the cities and turning around the places God tells us is because we serve a king that is more powerful than any other king. And he is truly the king of kings. He is truly the most powerful king there is. And he is the stone, he is the rock that was hewn without hands, the Bible says. Hewn without hands, this rock, this king. And what he does is always powerful. It's so powerful to destroy the greatest, the greatest kingdoms. I want you to know you and I have the privilege of not only being servants in that kingdom, but being kings to the king of that kingdom that destroys every work of darkness. I'm trying to talk to you about the king of kings. Okay, so I I think you're ready for this next verse, Ecclesiastes 8. You guys okay? So why are you saying this? Because I want you to understand the supply that's coming to you is so powerful. The biggest question the enemy gets you to ask is, am I powerful? The supply coming to you is powerful. He's supplying you in such a level. Look at this verse with me. Can I, can I stand up here? Is it all right? Can you guys still see me? Where the word of a king is. Have we, have we established very clearly in, in John 15 where the word of the king is? Where's the word of the king in John 15? We're, if my word abides down the street. If my word stays on the pages, if my word is on TBN, come on, somebody, if my word, that doesn't sound like you're very happy about the word abiding in you. Where's the word of God abiding? Come on, say it with a little little confidence. Not with your past, with your future in you. Now, I want you to see this because if you, if you knew what we were about to talk about, you would, get, you would have been excited. Because where the word of, the, of a king is, there is power. See, Jesus is saying if, if you can keep my word in you, you'll ask whatever you want. I never know why it falls at that, at that scripture, because that's the most powerful scripture I see, is that the king's word is inside of me. And that, that when, when that word is inside of me, when I speak, there's power. When I say to someone's body, the king says, there's power. Do you know that there was, we, we, there was power as a priest? Do you know that when someone did not know their value, that you would take them to a priest? And the, they would stand him in front of the priest, and the priest would say, your value is this. That's power in the mouth of a priest. That, that literally I could announce to you that you are blessed, and that is the value that you are because of my priestly anointing. Now, we don't understand. That's a priest. This is a king. And you have that inside of you. Inside of you is the power 
of the king's words. What are you going to do with them? Okay, let's look. This is, this is how powerful these words are the, of the king. It says, who may say to him, what are you doing? All right, that doesn't sit well. Let's go to the next one. I, I, it may be too deep. It may be too far. But I want you to understand that God looked at Nebuchadnezzar and gave him a dream. He says, you think you're powerful? You think you're mighty? Let me tell you, you are the most mighty of all the kingdoms that are coming. But I'm working on a kingdom. But I'm working on a kingdom. And this kingdom has not only me as the king or a king that I set up, but it has kings. And these kings are just exact of the king that I set over them. So we love seeing Jesus separate from us. We love seeing Jesus far from us. We love seeing Jesus in this space when the whole thing that he wanted to do is elevate us to his same monarch level. He's the king of kings. Revelations tells us that he's the king of kings. We may look at that in a moment. Look what it says here in Matthew 16. Don't die off on me here. Let's stay with me. Stay with me here because I want, I want you to get this. Um, Matthew 16, 18 says, and, and I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock that was hewn out of the mountain, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You, know, you already know that the, the word rock and Peter are the exact same word. And I think what he's saying is that he's saying, Peter, you are a chip off of the old block. You, you, you are, you are, you're not a, 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 a liking like, you're not liking to me, but you're exactly. I think sometimes we like to be likened to Jesus. Oh, you're like, you're, like, you're like Jesus. But I'm not like Jesus. I'm exact. I, I may be a, a... See, if I took a big, you know, that rock that came out from Nebuchadnezzar, if I took that, and I took a little chip of it, and, and someone did some research on it, they would find that it's the same, same DNA of that, that there's no difference. This is what makes us clean is the, his word talks as if we're not different. His word talks to us as if we're exactly the same. So if that's true, as we're, as we're drilling down to this, then, the, then if God's setting up his kingdom and he's trying to use you and I as kings, in his kingdom. You know what I like about being a monarch under a monarch? Is that years ago, Terrence, the Lord said, you know, what's, what's going on? You need to stop doing that. I said, well, God, you made me a strategist. I love strategizing. You made me a strategist. He goes, yeah, I made you a strategist not so that you can strategize, but so that you can understand my strategies. I don't actually want you to strategize. I want you to actually understand my strategy so you can implement my strategy. And what, the reason he wants kings is so that he can bring a king-level supply to you. It's hard to receive a king-level supply as a pauper. I mean, if you open up a big chest to me of, of, of whatever it is, let's say, you know, even the mindset of, you know, that there are, there are warehouses in heaven full of body parts. How many of you have ever heard that? Several people have gone to heaven and they've seen this imagery. I don't know why God shows that, but that's what he shows. And I, I mean, okay, would you go in there going, okay, there's, I, it's a shopping spree? My hip's been hurting me, but it's a shopping spree. Am I going to go in there and just get my hip? Am I going in there to get everybody's? Because I have to have a mindset of a king, not a mindset of a pauper, in order to handle his supply. His supply is so big. And I think we're constantly trying to dial down his supply. And so we love to talk about suffering. and We love to talk about being victims. But his supply never, never, he would never, ever supply me only to the level of being a victim. 
His supply is too intense. He's saying, I have a king's ransom supply. I need kings to to handle my distribution. I I, I, want to be God's distribution center. I want to be God's distribution center. I do. I want to be God's distribution center. You need a new throat? Here you go. (laughs) Come on, somebody. At what level do you want that distribution to come through? Oh, you need a new building? Okay, there you go. I want to be God's distribution center, but he can't give it to me if I don't actually think like a king, act like a king, and take on my monarch position. He needs me to rise and understand that it's not me that supplies, but it's him who's supplying. How much supply can I handle? Do I have to turn the trucks back? Uh, Sorry, I can't take any more trucks. You know the Bible tells us that he loads us daily with his benefits? I mean, you have a shipment coming in every day, but you haven't unloaded the previous shipment? Come on, you have, you have, a, load, you have a shipment coming in tomorrow morning. What are you doing with today's shipment? Oh, I need to keep the glory today. No, give it out. So that you are lo- you're ready for the glory tomorrow. Amen. You're getting loaded every day, you know, with God's blessing shipments. <laughs> every day there's a truck backing up. There's a prophet that used to say, he's backing up. Beep, 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 beep. He's gone on to be with the Lord. So, but he, beep, how many of you hear that? I want you to hear that every day. You wake up, beep, beep, oh, the, the, open up the loading docks. God's goodness is on his way. Oh, yes, just, just, oh, you, you just, just hand me the little paper bag out the window. No, I need to have rolling doors. Come on, somebody. I need to have, I need to have stuff. Because you know what? You know what I realize is that uh, people get saved and they're more excited about God, and they're, they're thrilled about God when you, got, when you get saved. You're thrilled. You're excited. You, that expectation. I mean, I, I, I just, it was amazing. When I got saved, I asked God for shoes. Come on, somebody. And I got, I don't even ask God for shoes anymore. I just go buy shoes. Come on, somebody. I, but, you know, when, after a while, if we, there's things that when you can get things without asking, you lose a little bit of that expectation. And you, you can actually, what's really interesting is that the reason people get more, more people get saved by a new convert, even though they don't understand what they're even in. They don't know the Bible verses. They can't tell you anything except for how excited they are and how much they're expecting something new to come. Do you know why old berries don't win church, don't win people? To, it, it's because you lost your excitement. And it's because you are so used to not receiving shipments. But when you're receiving shipments, come on, somebody. When you're excited about a shipment, people will see that excitement in your face. And I believe that that's why we need a move of you getting a breakthrough so that you're excited to talk about Jesus again. As long as you're in a normal life with everybody normal, you don't need to talk about Jesus. But when you are expecting God to do something, when you are seeing God do stuff, when God's turning stuff around. I was telling my wife this week, I I said, you know, when I got saved, I I was, they took me out on the streets. And all I knew was evangelism. I used to take teams and teams and teams and teams of people. All I knew was evangelism. And I remember going on the street one day and we actually was the first, one of the first days and they took me to the Tacoma Mall. I was at the Tacoma Mall, and, um, and, and someone saw me. I, was, I think I was just a couple of days old in the Lord. And they said, hey, what's going on? What's new? And I said, oh, nothing. I said, nothing's, nothing's new. And I walked away, and I got home, and the Holy Spirit said, why didn't you tell them about me? I said, well, uh, I didn't, wasn't ashamed. I just didn't know. And he said, I'm new. See, when you don't have a new relationship with God, you have nothing new to talk about. 
And he and it was like, and it was it was like this. It was like this. If Jeff, you and I were sitting, you know, if I, well, you know, we run in and we run into you, Melania, and I say, "Hey, how are you doing, Melania? This is great, great, great." You know, so like, don't introduce him to you. That's rude. That's how he felt. He felt that this was rude because I'm the new one. See, the realization is we need to, we need to have these breakthroughs again. I bought, I bought a, a, I, bought a, I don't know how I'm going to use it, but I bought a URL because I'm always thinking of one. And I thought, I want a URL that shows how God is so good to people so that we can get people excited about expe- expecting God again. I don't know how to use this. It's called Blessing Bling. But I'm not. <laughs> blessing Bling. Baby shark. Da, da. I want you to understand God wants you to be blessed. But you ha- we all have to elevate the word in us so that we stop thinking like paupers, even thinking like princes. But we have to think like kings. God wants to elevate us. And if, if we can do this, then we'll see this, the kingdom of God will come. And Romans 14, 17 says this, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. Someone say righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. I want you, I want you to see this because we started to realize, when I started, to, I started to realize God was showing me something when I was reading this, is that the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw was the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has kings and kings, has a king and kings. How many of you know you're part of the kings? But I realized something. (laughs) That the manifestation of the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The major attacks that I see on the world is unrighteousness, the lack of peace, and a false joy or a depression. And I realize the enemy is trying to show that he's Nebuchadnezzar, king of kings. And we have to say, we have a king who is king of... See, if you and I aren't ruling those three areas, then the kingdom of God has not come. We can talk about the kingdom of God all we want to. But if we're not letting the supply of righteousness to come to us, we're not letting the supply of peace to come to us, we're not letting the supply of joy of the Holy Spirit to come to us. I'm not talking about joy because we can go and find people that are singing about joy right now with some kind of bitter lemon something in their hands. That's why I love that it says the kingdom of God is not just joy, but it's joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not a false joy. It's not a a made-up joy. It's not a trumped-up joy. It's not a stirred-up joy. It's a joy that comes from deep within, a Holy Ghost joy, a joy that is stirred up. Come on, somebody. Stirred up from the deep wells within you. This is the kingdom of God. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of, you know what I love? Is that it's not enough for Jesus to be the king of kings that has glorious power. Because he's not here. He's at the right hand of the Father. Making intercession. Sending out intercession. Sending out insights to his children. To his kings on the earth. And the reason the kingdom of God is not on the earth is because you and I still think it comes from the rock. From the mountain. But you and I need to be the hammer of the Lord that smashes in pieces. All of the other kingdoms that try to say that their king is more powerful. That try to say every other king is powerful. I'm telling you, the devil is trying to mock our Jesus. He's trying to mock our Jesus. How do you know that, Mr. Armstrong? Because he's saying sin is going to continue to increase, and you have nothing you can do about it. 
I can't believe I can drive almost anywhere in the nation. And I, if I wanted to go get butted, but I don't, if I wanted to, I could. When I got saved, that was sin. I had to lay, I had to put that stuff at the altar. Can you imagine if I kept dealing? You would have saw Tracy, you would have saw T Man's <laughs> cannabis shop. You would have saw it right on the road. Because if I didn't have to let that go, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> but but if I didn't if I didn't have to put that at the altar. Lit, you, I would have been wealthy, filthy wealthy, right? Because I would have been, st I, I, I had a customer list. I had a list, y'all. I mean, I'm telling you, I, that was sin then, and I had to let it go. And it's now on all, almost every street that literally I drove in one time trying to go get some coffee somewhere, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to get a show. I wanted a, I wanted a flat white. Oh. Watch that one. <laughs> he's, he's trying to mock the church. He's trying to mock the kingdom of God, saying, you think you're the king of kings? Where are your kings? I'm the greatest king. And I want you to know he's not the greatest king. We have the king that is above all kings, and we're going to prove it. We're going to prove it by the supply he brings through us. Peace. 1990-something, I think in 97, 97, the Lord showed me that 2020 would be the number one, number one disabled disability in the earth would be chronic depression. And guess what? We're knocking on the door, and that's what it is. And I want you to know it's mocking that we have a kingdom that brings peace. Come on, kings. You have a supply of peace that's backing up to your house today. Not just for you. See, a king doesn't get it just for you. King has a bunch of, bunch of people that you have to pass out to. Come on. That's why he doesn't want you to think like a prince because a prince can eat for themselves. But a king has to get enough for them and everybody else around them. Get your breakthrough and then have plenty left over. He needs you to think like a king. Don't be satisfied with you having peace. It mocks Jesus that you have next-door neighbors that don't have peace. Stand, we see peace going out. Peace. We have, a, we have a season where peace can no longer be the real thing. But it has to be what we can buy. Peace. Joy in the Holy Spirit. How, come, how can you have joy in the Holy Spirit when you don't allow the Holy Spirit even to show up anymore? I mean, the only way, the times that I had joy in the Holy Spirit is when he showed up and I was like, what are you doing? And then next time I'm on the floor. And I'm laughing, and you guys are laughing at me. What a joyful time. <laughs> that was fun. And I was on my way home. My wife had to drive because I couldn't drive. And she's driving so fast. <laughs> I'm like, slow down. You're going so fast. You're going to have to put my feet up on the dash. Stop it. You're going so fast. <laughs> and she was going like, she never drives fast. She's going to the speed limit. But it felt like she was going so fast. How many want a supply of joy? I mean, we were a supply of it. I mean, I can be so supplied. I believe that he has a king's supply that no matter what's going on in the earth, it can't take away my king's supply of joy. <laughs> Amen. I forget what I was supposed to tell. <laughs> oh, that's right. When I first got saved, I got saved there at Cedar Park Assembly of God, just in Kirkland, Redmond area. And I went back, I went back home. I just, I just, every night I would smoke weed and I would drink a, a beer with my, my meal. And I did that the same as any other time. 
And next thing you know, the Holy Spirit, I just felt like he was gone. And I said, where did you go? Where did you go? I need you to come back. And I said, if you come back, I will never do this, touch this again. And immediately he came back. But he left everything, every, all the stuff that pushed him away left me immediately. I'd never been sobered like that in my life. Been sober ever since. I want you to know that he, he left. When it showed up, he left. He didn't want to share the stage with that. Can I read, can I read a few more? John 15, 8. We're going to just finish off with this, John, and we're going to go down to verse 11. Are you guys getting anything out of this? You are God's king representatives here on the earth. Let's do it. Let's, let's function like it. It says here in verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. This is how we glorify him is that he's saying, I'm sending a supply and all of it gets there. Do you know we used to send, we send stuff to Africa, we send stuff to nations, we send stuff to places, and it wouldn't all get there. It'd get like sifted all the way through. I want, I want to be able to allow whatever Jesus is sending to the earth, I want it all to function. If God has breakthrough, come on, somebody. God has kidneys. He's got everything. I want it to function. I want it to function. I'm tired of having a God that we have to make excuses for. Well, you know, if you just had more faith. Come on. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says. If my Father, my Father's glorified when we bear much, much fruit. It says, so you will be my disciples. In verse 9, that shows us that our discipleship is fruit-oriented. I wish I had like at least the three days on that one, that your discipleship is fruit-oriented. You can't say you're a disciple if you have no fruit. You go to church, but your fruit is the discipleship, is the sign of your discipleship. Verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. So now we get to abide in the love of God. Verse 10, it says, if you keep my commandments, that's the word, you will abide in my love. Verse 11, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, verse, yeah, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. So if we get the word, we get the righteousness, we get the peace, and we get his joy. That my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. I want full joy. That's how we know we're in the kingdom of God. If you and I are, are just as sad as the people in the earth, in the world, then we don't, we don't, we're not of the kingdom of God. We said a prayer, but we haven't allowed the king's ransom to come through us. I want the king's level of joy to come through me. I want the king's level of peace to come through me. I want the king's level of righteousness to come through me. How many of you want the king's level to come through you? I don't want to have a day where I'm sad because I'm, I'm the king today. I'm a king under a king. I'm not, a ki I'm not my own king. I'm a king under a king. When he declares something, I declare it. Come on, somebody. That's what a king does. When the king declares it, I declare it. He wants me to know how to be a king so that I'm not a strategist on my own, but I know how to function in his strategies. The reason you need the word is because the word needs to be declared, declared the way that he declared it. If he said you're victorious, then you declare it. If he says that you're an overcomer, then you declare it. If he says you're the head and not the tail, then you declare it. You guys with me? Let's stand to our feet. Let's give the Lord a big clap and a shout. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We declare you as the king of kings. We declare you as the king of kings. Now, I want you to figure out how you can apply this, this word this week. How could you apply this? Think about it. Just make that a part of your, your identity this week. You're going to think of, how can I apply this message to my life? Even if it's just one aspect of it. Because if, if you hear a message and you don't ever work it into your life, it's a gone. It's a gone. It's just gone. It's another talk. But you need to work it in. So what is God declaring in your life that you haven't been declaring? Maybe he says, you are healed. By my stripes, you are healed. Have you been declaring that in your life? I'm healed. 
My body's healed. My mind's healed. My life is healed. Declare it in your life. Because when you do that, you come under the king's authority, which he is never wrong. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who's going to question it? So if you say, I'm healthy, who's going to question it? No one. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask if there's anyone here that you are not right with God. You haven't made that connection with Jesus. You haven't surrendered your heart and your mind to him. And you know that there's another level for you to live. And he wants to be your Lord. He wants to first be your prince before he can be your king. And the way to make him your prince is to see, receive him as your savior. The Lord and savior of your life. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and savior of your life, it's, it's a simple prayer. Just ask him to come into your heart, come into your life, forgive you of all of your sins. And he'll do that. He'll cleanse you. His word will come and make you whole and make you clean. He'll set you on a new path. And then you'll start walk, walking with Jesus the king. And he'll teach you how to be victorious in every area of your life. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, is there anyone you want me to pray with you today? Today, Want me to pray with you and want me to believe with you that God is going to receive you into his kingdom? I'm going to count the three. Is there anyone you want to just make sure you're right with God? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of all of my sins. I thank you that from today on, heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to do, the Lord challenged me this week. I love the challenges of God. How many of you like God to be a challenger in your life? He does it because he wants you to be like him. I felt like if there weren't any people who get, get saved in service, that the Lord wanted me to release impartations to you an impartation to win the loss. That it's not, he, and he's, he said these words, he said there's a difference between being compelled and um, um, being compelled and having a uh, inward initiation, just having an inward, um, what's the word? I can't think of it. Imp um, impulsion, impulsion and compulsion is the difference. Compulsion is an outward, outward pushing you. Impulsion is an inward moving me. An impulsion comes from an impartation. Compulsion comes from a condemnation. And I don't want you to be condemned. I want you to be impulsed. I want you to have God moving you. So if you want an impartation, just lift your hand. I'll, I'll just release it this week, this way. But I, I'm going to lay hands on you as we come in the seasons come. Because I want to release this impartation that you have an impulse to win loss. You have a, a love, a craving. So Father, we thank you for your anointing to win people, to gather them and bring them into the kingdom of God. Lord, let there be an impulsion in your people. Look at their hearts. All the hearts are saying, yes, God, use me. I pray that you would stir up in them. Lord, the things that, that the Bible says the kingdom of God is, stir up in them to help people come to righteousness, help people come to peace, help people come to joy. I thank you, Father, that you're empowering your people to be winners, to be winners, to be winners in every level. Winners of those that are far from God. Winners of those that are close to God. Winners of those that are near you but don't function and walk with you. I pray in the name of Jesus you release this anointing to win the lost, to draw them into the kingdom of God. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. If you believe that impartation has started in your life today, will you give the Lord a big clap and a shout?